Hello, my name is Marcus. I'm the compiler of a collection of therapy quotes entitled 1001 Windmills of the Mind. This is TQ 1432 to 1455, where we will be adding a few quotes to our thread on symbiosis. There are over 30 threads throughout this series or topics or themes. One of them is this very difficult topic called symbiosis, meaning that when the baby was in the womb, he was uh, pretty much in a symbiotic state with his mother. He totally needed his mother for everything. Now because humans come out too early, children need what's called an extended womb. So the symbiosis that took place in the intrauterine womb is meant to continue in the extrauterine womb, Waller calls the social symbiosis. But the key there is that the symbiosis needs to continue. So symbiosis means that when the baby was in the womb, all of his needs got met automatically according to the baby's needs. And in this extended womb or social symbiosis, the mother's attuned and she meets the baby's needs accordingly. So the mother uh, feeds according to the baby's needs and responds immediately to the baby's needs. The baby's meant to think that he's still in the womb, right? Um, yeah, the, the mosquito's sort of been a constant companion throughout this series. Um, the companion animals in this series have been the mosquito, the bee, the heron. Sometimes we get the seal. If we're lucky, we'll see the seal. Uh, recently, recently we caught a glimpse of the Canada geese, a very rare appearance. Um, and uh, when we're indoors, it's the blue jay, the crow, and the fox. But I, but I have to say, the mosquito is truly the most constant, <laughs> the most steady, reliable. <laughs> so you may see a few mosquitoes here. In one video, I didn't realize it, but a mosquito was actually right on the camera, and you could sort of see him in the, in the video. <laughs> But the sun's just come out, which is nice, yeah. So we started a new thread in this series, this topic of symbiosis. Now, Mahler says that the baby needs this symbiosis. Again, this term is just a metaphor. Uh, the mother doesn't need the baby. Uh, for her survival, but the baby uh, needs the mother uh, for their survival. But the mother does need the baby for her survival in the role of being a mother. So when the baby's born, they bond, the mother's attuned, and with that attunement, uh, she feels in touch with her motherlinessness, her maternal life force availability becomes available to her to give to the child. Her maternal instinct kicks in with the bonding at birth. That's why when the baby's born, you want to hand the baby directly over to the mother because she produces all of these hormones to facilitate the bond to preserve the continuity of the symbiosis. Um, so this uh, social symbiosis um, is meant to continue for the first uh, four to five months. Now some authors say uh, the baby can begin to uh, wean himself off or begin to differentiate from his mother as early as three months. Mahler says on average is between four and five months. Uh, some authors say maybe as late as six and I saw one that says maybe six to seven. So we're just using Mahler's one here between four and five months. Um, now this is a natural phenomenon for the baby to begin the differentiation process. Right? Now when the baby begins to differentiate, meaning the baby gets a sense of uh, himself as a separate person from his mother and the mother is a separate person from him. Whereas prior to that it was called undifferentiation. So the stage of symbiosis or social symbiosis is also sometimes called the stage of undifferentiation sometimes called fusion. Um, 
sometimes called a psychological egg. I like that one because um, just like the baby was metaphorically hatched for his biological birth, he enters into this extended womb or this psychological egg and if he gets his symbiotic needs met, he begins to hatch out of the psychological egg for his psychological birth to take place later on. But this hatching out or um, of this uh, symbiosis uh, is gradual. It begins uh, at roughly four to five months and, um, and, uh, and it ends at around 36 months and there are various sub-phases in between uh, say five months and 36 months. So um, the reason uh, a lot of people talk about symbiosis is that um, the theory is if the child doesn't get his symbiotic needs met, he doesn't really go through the separation individuation process to reach his psychological birth. So again, Mahler says that um, the psychological birth of the child doesn't automatically appear with the biological birth. She says there's this process called the separation individuation process. But for the child to sort of go through this process, they need that extended symbiosis. They need that extended womb, that extra uterine womb, the psychological egg. They need that egg. Right? And this psychological egg is as important for the psychological birth as is the biological egg or uterus or womb is for the biological birth. So there's a real emphasis on how important um, this, uh, this social symbiosis is. And during this symbiosis, the mother pretty much has to be very attuned. She calls it optimal symbiosis. So no scheduled feeding, no force feeding, uh, no using the baby to comfort the mother, no violating the baby's needs. The mother's sole purpose for those first four to five months is to 100% be there to meet the baby's needs. Baby wants to sleep, the baby sleeps. Baby wants to feed according to the baby's uh, interests. Baby's too hot, the mother responds accordingly. The baby has to feel like he's still in the womb. It's an extended womb. Right? So if the child uh, gets this extended womb, then he uh, hatches toward his psychological birth. Now in this extended womb period called the social symbiosis or interpersonal symbiosis, um, if the child doesn't get it, the theory is he doesn't even really go through the separation individuation process. That person can s develop what's called the hostile provocative attachment style. Their main emotions, so their real self got totally repressed uh, to compensate, okay, Adler says inferiority complex, to compensate with the superiority complex. So they, their, their main interest in life is to use all of their energy for power and control to get others to um, cater to them, uh, thinking that maybe someone else can be their mother and meet their needs. It can't be done, it's a secondary delusion. And it, like Sisyphus, he can spend his whole life uh, trying to control others, and focused on power, to try harder. Um, and every time he does that, um, Burglar says he's trying to communicate that he didn't get his symbiotic needs. Another author says he's trying to communicate that he was prematurely ejected out of a psychological egg and he's angry. Um, now, um, when he's angry like that and he's trying to communicate that, he re-triggers the memory of him not getting his symbiotic needs met. Now he's hurt, again, out of his re-triggering, out of his behavior. Then, like Sisyphus, he wants to communicate it. So he, again, seeks power and control uh, to see if he can get his symbiotic needs met, to communicate that he didn't get his symbiotic needs met. And every time he does that, he re-triggers the memory of how he didn't get his symbiotic needs met. Now he's hurt again. Like Sisyphus, he's going to uh, use power and control over others to try to get someone else to meet their symbiotic needs. But when he does that, he triggers the memory of his mother not meeting his symbiotic needs met. And, okay, and then to communicate that, you see it's Sisyphus. So he can spend his whole life constantly trying to get someone else to be their mother. It can't be done. It's a secondary delusion. No one in the present uh, can be their breast mother. 
and uh, provide what they needed. Uh, it's almost as if the person theoretically thinks, you see, it's timeless. You see, the trauma that early, it's, it's in the state of timelessness, and they're operating out of that unconscious timelessness perspective. So they're, they're operating out of the perspective that they could, uh, from an observer's point of view, uh, what they're trying to do is um, find some lackey, uh, if you get them in a symbiosis, hop into some kind of sci-fi time travel machine, what is it, the DeLorean or something, travel back in time, back to the nursery, he, he morphs back into the baby in the crib, his lackey becomes the breast mother, they change history, they change the past, the lackey now, the breast mother, provides the, purse, the baby with what they needed, he gets what he needed, they morph back into their adult shapes, hop back into the time machine and travel back uh, to, the, to the present. It can't be done, it's a secondary delusion. But the person with that trauma is in that kind of timelessness state. They still think maybe they can do it because in their, they're in that timeless state. So that's why they're trying to get, they're always angry. Why don't someone should, they constantly demand respect, demand reverence, demand consideration, and they're easily slighted, they're easily angry. Because um, they're constantly trying to get someone to fuse with them. It can't be done, it's a secondary delusion, so they try harder, they're more aggressive, they find more ways, and um, then they come up with philosophies and rationalizations to energize them, to have more power, more control over others. It can't be done, so they're like Sisyphus. And every time they do that, they re-trigger the memory of how they didn't get their symbiotic needs met. Uh, that's painful, they want to communicate that. So like Sisyphus, they want to see if they can get someone else to fuse with them. It can't be done. That's painful. They get triggered again. They do it and it's, they're stuck like that. So the therapy process is to offer what's called the transference interpretation. When someone is doing that, um, they're trying to show what their childhood was like. So the therapist offers a transference interpretation. So that kind of behavior is a communication that they were prematurely ejected out of the symbiotic egg. Now the therapist doesn't then step in and try to meet those needs. He can't do it either. Not even the, the best therapist can do that. No one can do it. Right? The therapist has to help the person be aware of all this, bring all this to consciousness, build their understanding, build their awareness, build their ego. This leads to the realization that the mother didn't offer their needs. They're going to be angry at the mother. Then they're going to be sad. Then they understand that the mother was trapped in her existential dilemma with her traumas. Uh, there'll be sadness there. He'll understand himself, uh, he'll have mourning, now he's in the working through process, of the mourning process. And then um, with the knowledge and the insights, he's building, he's becoming his own parent, right, because he's uh, giving value to his understanding and his knowledge, that sort of becomes a, like an object for him, a new object, a helpful object. Uh, he goes through the mourning process, when he forgives the mother, um, then uh, he does what's called healing the splits. He faced the unconscious ambivalence. Okay. Because it was very difficult to admit that he's so angry at his mother. He was too blinded trying to get someone else to meet his needs. He, he can't even entertain the thought that he's enraged at his mother. He, he's, just, he's just in a panic to not feel that existential emptiness or the hungry, enraged, empty part self or the abandonment depression or this existential emptiness or this void or whatever we call it. Right. Uh, persecutory anxiety, Klein calls it. So he's just so he's just so uh, one self-help speaker. He used to be a rock star, by the way. He says um, emotional upset. Emotional upset leads to intellectual impairment. So he's not thinking clearly. His ego is damaged because the emotions are too strong. So he's when and again when there's a trauma, the person's trying to communicate it. He's trying to communicate it through his behavior. Now, why is he trying to communicate it through his behavior? Because he's trying to uh, find some way to master the trauma. Now, how is he trying to master the trauma? One author says he's trying to communicate to his mother in his mind of what he needed. So the person with the hostile provocative attachment style or the bully pattern or whatever you want to call it, when they're being belligerent and uh, rude and aggressive like that and forceful and trying to create a negative symbiosis and try to create a, a hate bond or, uh, you see, a bond, uh, so back up for a sec, a baby would rather, a baby would rather have a negative bond than no bond, right? So he'll look for that negative bond if he has to. And then he's going to try to say to his mother, look mother in the mind, 
You see, I I'm trying to create this bond with someone, and you never gave me a bond. And look how negative it, and look how negative it is. I don't even want that, but my main message is mother and the mind. I needed some kind of bond. And with the delusion that the mother will change and apologize, travel back in a time machine, re redo the past, go back to the nursery, all right? Change it, morph, change, redo, hop back in the time machine, come back. It can't be done. So the person is trying to communicate somehow. You see, when there's a trauma, it's called repetition compulsion, to try to master the trauma. How is he trying to master the trauma? He's trying to redo it, but he can't redo it. So, Berkler says, well, he's trying to communicate that he would like to redo it, and there's a delusion. No one, it, it, it's no use thinking that he's going to try to redo it. At least he's trying to communicate the situation. You see? That's why we want to bring the conscious to consciousness. See, all that trauma is unconscious. Now, as an adult, we have a consciousness. See? Um, so, there's that um, repetition compulsion around the hostile provocative style. So, in conclusion, if a person doesn't get their symbiotic needs met in the extra womb, in the, in the extra uterine womb, or in this stage of social symbiosis, in this stage of fusion with the mother, in this psychological egg, okay, if that doesn't get met, or if he was prematurely ejected out of it, he's, the main emotions are extreme hate, um, and all that hate is devoted to power and control. That's all they're doing, really. And uh, the moments when they get power and control, they feel moments of safety, so then the brain sends them serotonin, that's the schadenfreude. So their only sense of pain relief is the schadenfreude. That's called a pathological joy. Right? So they don't, you see, they, you see, they haven't, in order for love and gratitude, to enter the psychological picture, they need to differentiate out of the egg. But if they never even got the egg, they're still primarily stuck around those early needs of getting the egg needs met. And they can spend their whole lives like that. That's a, a, a difficult situation, right? So the, the interpretations offered by the therapist are geared towards that area. Now, um, let's say, um, Let's say that the child is fused with the mother, but it's a negative symbiosis. Now there's another scenario. Because if it's a negative symbiosis, that's maybe a little better than no symbiosis. But if it's a negative symbiosis, they're still angry. Uh, now what happens with a negative symbiosis is that when the child is meant to differentiate out of the egg, normally at four to five months, if it's negative, the child can't do it. Because if it's negative, that means the child is frightened. He's not getting basic trust to leave. The child needs enough love and basic trust to leave the egg. If he doesn't get enough love and basic trust, he stays in the egg, clinging to the rejecting image of the mother. Now why would the child do that? Fairbairn explains it. The more frightening, the more rejecting the mother is, the more the baby needs the mother, the more the baby clings to the mother, the more there's this tar pit of the negative symbiosis and he's stuck there in this tar pit of the negative symbiosis. Now if the child is stuck in this tar pit of the negative symbiosis, he can't differentiate. Now he's still fused with the mother, but it's a negative fusion. Never mind cognitive development, he can still become an engineer. We're talking about spiritual, psychological, emotional, moral, ethic, all that. All that we know about being human, the, the feelings, and empathy, and spiritual, and human, all that, fe the feminine side, the feelings, right? the moon, all that, the feminine uh, principle, right? So that, um, so he can develop cognitively. But if he's stuck emotionally, psychologically, spiritually in this fusion, right, with, in the tar pit, with the negative symbiosis with the mother, um, you see, uh, he'll be angry. Now, now, if this doesn't, if the child doesn't get enough love by the age of 15 months, okay, so between five months and 15 months, the, the mother has to change her ways and make and offer the baby enough trust and security to allow the child to differentiate. But if she doesn't, and if 15 months, or 15 between 15 and 18 months, if she still doesn't do it, okay, the child gives up. He does. 
what's called identification with the aggressor. So during the tar pit of the negative symbiosis, he was experiencing chronic pain, chronic persecutory anxiety. Uh, he felt, from the baby's point of view, he felt objectified, used, exploited, unloved, uncared for, unseen, and so on. At the age of 15 months, he gives up. His true self gets deeply repressed. Okay, so his image of himself, uh, by the way, is split. So his uh, primary true self gets uh, split and repressed. Uh, an aspect of his self related to that stage of development is called the grandiose self or the primary narcissism. So that's still there. So all he has is the grandiose part self because he thinks he's, that makes him feel important. It's all about him. That's sort of biological. Right? That's sort of fixed there. Right? Now he's fused with the omnipotent image of the mother. Now in his delusion, he thinks the mother's all great. He's not aware that the mother's so rejecting. Again, every baby makes his mother good, even when she's not good. The baby has to do that to have an attachment. So, we have an image, so the child has an image of himself, that's the grandiose part self, fused with the image of the other as this great, omnipotent, wonderful, amazing, powerful other. And he's fused there. It's like two overlapping circles and they're fused and it's like one circle. But there's two circles and there's one circle, you see it's fused there. And he's stuck. Now, he identifies with the other, the, the mother circle, and he thinks he's her. Now, the fusion is there, so he holds on to his grandiose part self, it's all about him, he's so important. He's fused with the omnipotent other, so there's the, the grandness of it all, how great, how great he is, and he's so special. That's a narcissistic pattern, it's all about him, and he's so important. Right? Now, because he identifies with the aggressor, And because his unloved self is now seen outward, okay, again, when something's projected, when something's repressed, the person later on somehow uh, gets them, the psyche gets them to think that it's outside to, in order to preserve the repression. That's called projection. Okay, so in the identification with the aggressor, that person is going to do to others what his mother did to him to communicate what his mother did to him. Now he's stuck in the Sisyphus repetition compulsion. Right? So the mother objectified and used him, he identifies with her, and then he does to others what his mother did to him because he's trying to communicate what his mother did to him. You see, again, when there's a trauma, he's trying to master it. How does he master it? Well, he's got to communicate it. How is he communicating it? Well, he's doing to others what his mother did to him. That's how he's trying to communicate it. Now, when he's doing that, he's re-triggering the pain. Now, when he's in that when he re-triggers the pain of being unloved and exploited by the mother, he wants to communicate that. So he identifies with the aggressor again, devalues others, to tell his mother in his mind or to anyone that that's what is um, that he's doing what his mother did to him, and he didn't like it. Right. Now, when he does that, he's re-triggered of being unloved by the mother, and he wants to communicate that. So he does to others what his mother did to him to communicate what his mother did to him. But when he does that, he feels re-triggered of being unloved by his mother. Now he wants to communicate that. See, and he's stuck there like Sisyphus. You see? So that's another version of the Sisyphus story. Okay? So the, er the first one was related to the bully pattern, where he's more uh, aggressive in his power and control and demanding and more forceful and uh, more aggressive about it. In the narcissistic pattern, it's more about devaluing, seeing people, putting people down with put down humor, negative humor, sardonic humor, cynical humor. Um, and his only sense of stress relief well, is in his identification with the aggressor. Okay, the mother got some stress relief when she used the baby to meet her needs. Right? And she felt safer. When a person uh, feels a little safer, the brain uh, sends, sends the person serotonin. Now he's identified with the aggressor, so his only concept of getting serotonin is to do what his mother did. What did his mother do? The mother put the child down. 
Well, now in the repetition compulsion, his wounded child is projected outward onto non-threatening substitute others. He identifies with the aggressor, puts others down. And when he does that, he gets the serotonin, just like his mother got the serotonin. So he's doing what his mother did to get the serotonin, because he identified with the aggressor. The aggressor got serotonin by putting the child down. He does, uh, he's doing the same thing. He identifies with her and puts others down. Now when he puts others down, what he's doing is he's seeing his unloved self onto others and he's putting others down, but he's really putting himself down. See? Because he's trying to communicate to his mother in his mind that he didn't like what she did to him. And she's doing and he's doing to others what his mother did to him. Now the, and it's you see, so how does he do it? His unloved self, he find he says it belongs to some non-threatening substance or other. Okay, some peaceful, benign, safe. He'll just make up some excuse, any excuse, it doesn't matter. Uh he can make up anything, uh. It's, 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 it, he does any trifle, he can make up anything. He'll manufacture, he'll, he has to hallucinate it even, if, even if it's a psych, he'll do, it, <laughs> because the psyche, <sighs> you see, the, here's where the distortion takes place. The psyche seeks wholeness. Now, how does the psyche seek wholeness? The psyche uses projection to get the person to see what's within. Now, again, when something's repressed, to keep it repressed, the psyche gets the person to say it's outward. That's how he keeps it repressed. That's called projection. Okay, again, projection is the means of bringing repressed material to consciousness. So the repressed material, in this case with the narcissistic pattern, is his hungry, enraged, empty, uh, self-despised, self-hated, unloved self. That's repressed. Okay, so it's this worthless self, let's say. No good self, right? It's repressed. Now the psyche wants him to see that it's repressed. So he, the psyche gets the person to say it's outward, that it belongs to someone else. Now he's doing that, it's, it's meant to be like a mirror. It's meant for him to see what's repressed. See? Now if he's not aware of that, he just says it's outward. And then he preserves the repression. And then he re preserves the repetition compulsion. He preserves the identification with the aggressor. And he's like Sisyphus. He can end up uh, as a called the hostile mind. He doesn't know what love and gratitude means. His, his main emotions are hate, greed, envy, envy, spite, addictiveness, schadenfreude. And his only concept of joy is the schadenfreude. He can only get serotonin by putting others down because his mother put the child down and that's how the mother felt better. The mother used the child because she wasn't happy in her relationship. So the theory around that is, why would a mother use the child and exploit her? Well, some mothers uh, find themselves unhappy in their marriage for whatever reason, and they figure, well, they can use the child to meet their needs. That's called the Jocasta style of mothering. Right? So some mothers say, oh, look, finally, someone's going to respond to me, give me consideration, listen to me, do what I say, respond to me, respect me, see me, mirror me, uh, give me due consideration, validate me. Because the mother didn't feel that when she was a child. So she's caught in her repetition compulsion. She's trying to communicate to her mother in the mind by behaving that, by doing to the child what her mother did to her. See, so that's called intergenerational trauma. Hold on a sec. I think the sun's come out a bit. Yeah, no sign, no sign of the heron or the geese or the seal. Yeah, it's been quiet here. Um, so, um, okay, so key concept. If something's, if the child experiences uh, too much pain about his self-concept, it's repressed. It 
Now the psyche wants the person to be aware of this. So the psyche instructs the person's own unconscious ego okay, to get the person to think somehow that what's repressed is outward. So the metaphor for this is projection. The unconscious ego is holding this little film projector. And on this, it's like the real, the old ones, the real, the real, the real. So on this real, uh, there's a real, there's the, the film. The film represents the painful experiences. Now the unconscious ego is holding this film projector and he's projecting the images onto a screen. So the screen is outward. So they find some non-threatening substitute other because it's safe. So if it's safe, you do it. That's the condition, right? They're safe. You know, nice people are often scapegoated because they're nice and they're safe and the people are picking them. Yeah. So the unconscious ego uh, are, uh, is uh, using the film projector, throwing out the images onto the other person. So the, now the person finds himself thinking all of these negative things that's on the film, not realizing that it's within. But the unconscious ego is saying, hey, conscious ego, I'm showing you what's within through your attitudes and your negative opinions about this non-threatening substitute other. I'm doing this because the psyche is instructing me to do this because the psyche seeks healing because there's an innate drive for healing. And I'm cooperating with the psyche. This is a natural organic process for healing. It's in nature. Nature seeks healing. Right? So, um, so projection is the means or the vehicle or the avenue of bringing repressed material, material to consciousness. Lachlan calls it a mirror defense. When a person's projecting onto the screen, they're seeing the screen image. That's like a mirror. That's like a mirror. The person sees it and thinks, oh, that's what's within. You see, so that's how, the, that's how the psyche is trying to help the person heal. Now, we want to cooperate with nature's way. Right, of, of healing ourselves, I mean, right? So nature is trying to get us to heal. We want to cooperate with that. Right? Right? So nature got the unconscious ego to get us to see our negative opinions uh, onto this non-threatening substitute other by creating this mirror. We, our conscious ego is meant to say, oh, this negative, all these negative opinions, that's myself. I think I'm, I, I'm referring to how I was unloved and how I was devalued and how I was unwanted or how I was rejected. Really, my mother rejected me. Oh my God. And I can help towards the healing process. You see, that's how, right? That's how the psyche is helping the person to heal. We want to own our projections. You see? So um, that's a key concept. I, I, I wish this could be more, uh, better, you know. Bruce Springsteen can see this video and present it at his concerts, right? <laughs> I mentioned Bruce Springsteen because uh, in Toronto, um, in the introduction to one of his songs, he gave a little mini psychology lesson. Um, he has a song called uh, Independence Day about forgiving his parents. And in, in the intro and before he sang the song, he gave this little introduction. It was a little bit of a therapeutic idea he was giving. So if you look up uh, Toronto Independence Day, Bruce Springsteen, 2000, I forgot the year, 2002 or 12 or something like that. Um, actually, I played it in the core collection. If you want to dig back into early in the core collection of the quotes, I played the video. So projection is the psyche's attempt to get us to see what's repressed so we can own what's repressed so we can go through the mourning process and heal. You see? So what about another Sisyphus pattern? Another, a third Sisyphus pattern 
let's say the child does um, differentiate for the most part at um, the age of 15 months. He does differentiate. He get he's very excited now. He goes, "Wow, I'm a person. Mother's a person. I'm a," and he's moving towards the "I'm okay, you're okay," right? And he, he has this love affair with the world. He's very curious, he, right? And now what the mother does is uh, she, her her duty is a little easier actually. At this point, she's just a secure base, and she does what's called communicative matching, a little improv. The child finds. Uh, you know, uh, the child finds uh, some seaweed. Hey, uh, mom, what's this? Uh, what's this smelly grass? What is all this? Oh, that's called seaweed. Oh, wow, cool. Why is there so much seaweed? What's this about? And she, well, there's a story about it, and, it, and I've got a fun story about it. You want to hear? Oh, yeah. I'm curious. So the mother pulls out uh, uh, the kids' book on the seaweed. Child learns how uh, you know. Uh, sometimes it's even possible to uh, uh, dry it up and uh, and uh, add some salty flavor to your food. And, wow, really? You, you could eat it? Oh, wow. so the child's learning. <laughs> so the child's very curious during that phase. Now, during this process, the child is learning what he likes and what he doesn't like. Now this goes on up to the age of 36 months. Mahler says it can happen as early as 30 months. So between 30 and 36 months, the child achieves what's called whole object relations. A fuller, a deeper, uh, a much greater sense of two people. That's I'm okay, you're okay. That's natural development. The child has uh, a cluster of memories of receiving enough love during the symbiosis enough love during the mirroring stage, the narcissistic period, from 5 months to 15 months, enough love and support during the rapprochement phase, from 15 months to 36 months. All of those memories are within. All of these memories allow the child what's called ontological security, basic trust. He feels safe with himself now. Now with that inner safety, the child's life force can deconfect from the image of the mother and can invest in self-representation. That's called getting the key out from under mother's pillow. At that time, any emergency defense mechanism that the child needed up to that point all become existential hearsay. Okay. Now those emergency defense mechanisms that the child adopted when there was stress during those first three years, for example, splitting, the moral defense, identification with the aggressor, reaction formation, projective identification, and a couple of others. They all, and the narcissism and the false self and the grandiose thinking and the magical thinking, all those things, all those infantile things uh, become existential hearsay. He doesn't need it anymore. He may temporarily need them and it's okay for the first three years because of this super small size compared to the giantess in the nursery. So he may adopt these desperate measures in his mind. But with enough love, he's stronger enough to say, oh, okay, I get it now. I'm a person, mother's a person. Uh, she's loving, sometimes uh, not perfect, but that's okay. She, he can handle that ambivalence. Now with that security, Robert Blythe says, he gets the key out from under mother's pillow. That's full difference. That's uh, pretty much differentiation, almost full difference differentiation. So he achieves differentiation and it's as full as it can get. Now with that differentiation, he got the key out from under mother's pillow. He then has access to the real self part of himself because now that his life force, now that he has this inner safety, his inner security, his ontological, existential felt sense, he's embodied now, his feelings. You see, if he's if he doesn't get that, he's terrified in the battle with the mother, in the repetition compulsion of trying to show the world how bad the mother was, and uh, either showing, either showing, uh, either telling the world that the mother didn't give him his egg needs met, or either telling the world uh, that the mother didn't see him, and he's trapped in this negative tar pit of the symbiosis with the mother, and um, feeling devalued, and then devaluing others to communicate that the mother devalued him, or if he's in the rapprochement phase. Uh, he's a little better off. What he does in the rapprochement phase, he's sort of like the clinger and the pleaser and the helper. Uh, he's overly, unrealistically optimistic and helpful to please people because he still thinks he can uh, 
find a good parent uh, to complete the process and he's stuck between 15 months and 36 months. That's called a clinger. Uh, they sacrifice themselves. Uh, they, they are capable of love and gratitude because they've achieved uh, differentiation. Uh, I don't know how much differentiation, but they've achieved, let's say, a good portion of differentiation has achieved. Now, the more differentiation is achieved, the more we say love and gratitude have entered the psychological picture. Love and gratitude from the mother is needed for the, for the child to differentiate. If, he, if the child doesn't get love, he can't differentiate. He's still stuck in the negative tar pit of the negative symbiosis during the stage of undifferentiation. He can't differentiate from the mother. He's still stuck there. He's a mama's boy, right? Alice Miller says not all mama's boys are uh, very rude and aggressive and all that. But all people who are rude and aggressive uh, are mama's boys. Uh, so just to finish that thought, um, we're not blaming the mother here. The mother uh, was, was caught. The mother has intergenerational trauma. When she was a child, her mother didn't offer her a secure attachment style. See? Now in the repetition compulsion, she does one of two things. It's as if she says to the child, look child, I'm going to communicate to my mind, I'm going to communicate to my mother in my mind that I didn't like not getting a secure attachment, that I, that I don't, that I didn't like not getting a secure attachment style. So I'm going to keep, I'm going to give you an insecure attachment, an insecure attachment style because I want to show my mother in the mind what she gave me. That's intergenerational trauma. Or the alternative is, a woman with the Jocasta style might say, okay, here's a child Finally, I'm going to get my needs met, and she's going to parentify the child. That's called childhood parentification. The child can't handle it, but the child wants the attachment, so he sacrifices his true self, develops what's called the false self, and through this as if false self, he's going to try to please his mother. And that can lead to one of those three core patterns just mentioned. The hostile one in the early stage, the narcissistic stage and the codependent clinger one in that sort of later third stage. And there are other patterns and there are variations of it. Yeah, we often forget this point, but uh, on the Enneagram, the unhealthy eight, the bully, and the unhealthy five, the schizoid, they're linked. They're, they're, they're often the same right? person. It's interesting about the Enneagram that the five and the eight are linked like that. So the five is the introverted schizoid version of the bully pattern. See, they, they often they often get together. I notice right? a detached intellectual, aloof, will marry some the opposite, uh, a very aggressive bully type of person, because that's the external representation. That's them in the ex. They're expressing, the eight is expressing what the five can't, you see. And the eight is happy to have so a lackey who will go along, you know, collusion that way. Right? Um, yeah, hold on. Nice to get some blue sky here. Overt or introverted version of the bully pattern is the unhealthy five on the Enneagram. One form of that is the Iago character. So that's always a hard thing to summarize, the Iago one. The best uh, summary of it is in that 1955 
comic series called Psychoanalysis. It's recently been reprinted by EC Comic Archive, Dark Horse Publishing, 1955. They discuss a character in there called Freddie Carter. Now, he wasn't loved by his mother, he wasn't loved by his father, but he was able sometimes to get them to argue amongst themselves, and he felt relief. Now that's Iago. Iago does that. He spreads rumors to get others to argue, and then he feels some relief. So the only time he felt better is when he saw his parents arguing with themselves and he felt relief. Otherwise, one or the other parent was bothering him. Okay. So he became detached like that, and then that, that became his uh, psychic structure. And then he spent the rest of his life spreading rumors to get others against themselves, because he's repeating. You see, when he's doing that, his repetition compulsion, his Sisyphus, he's trying to say that, his, that both parents were giving him a hard time, and the only time he got relief was, is when he got the parents to argue amongst themselves. You see, that, and he's trying to communicate that. See? So that's the Iago Sisyphus. Okay, we mentioned the bully pattern Sisyphus, the narcissistic pattern Sisyphus, the devaluing narcissism. Now there's the closeted version of it, where they just bask and others doing that. There's the borderline, the BPD one. That's the sort of the tenuous one. Uh, there are fragmented narcissists. Their narcissistic pattern is sort of fragmented. Swiss cheese, let's call it the Swiss cheese narcissistic pattern. And they're aggressive and impulsive to restore their narcissistic pattern. Then they go, then they re-engage in the narcissistic pattern. But when it, but when they reach a hole in their pattern, then they become more like the bully pattern. Then they go back to the narcissistic pattern. I think that's the narc I think that's the BPD pattern. Grotsky talks about that. Uh, yeah, James Grotstein talks about that. Then you got the codependent pattern. They're still holding on to hope. They still hold on to the I'm not okay, you're okay. Whereas the prior ones, they can't do it. They identify with the aggressor, think they're okay, and everyone else is no, not okay. But really what they're doing is they're holding on to the I'm not okay with the false delusion that they're okay and others are not okay. Because the child deludes that the mother's okay, he becomes the mother and then adopts this, his own deluded image of his mother and thinks it's his. That's why he says he's okay and others are not okay. He's hold, he's still, that's his loyalty to the mother in the mind, that's his negative symbiosis to the mother in the mind, adopting his fake attitude towards her as his. That's how he preserves his negative tar pit with the symbiosis with the mother. That's quite a not to unravel, isn't it? You know, narcissistic pattern. But it can be done. It's described in, Narc in um, Masterson's book, James F. Masterson, in all of his books, he discusses this. He has an approach called mirroring interpretation of narcissistic vulnerability. That's sort of the pathway to that. that. He, he, he describes this and teaches this in his books. The codependent one, um, they just distort reality over in an overly optimistic way. So uh, it's easier um, to, because they're closer to the truth. They're, they're, the truth is, I'm okay, you're okay. They're closer to that. See, anything other than I'm okay, you're okay is an aberration, is arrested development relational trauma, developmental trauma, and they're stuck like Sisyphus repeating it. So, um, so ideally, if the child gets his symbiotic needs met, the egg needs, and then he gets uh, his mirroring needs, and then he gets his communicative and matching needs met, then he gets the whole object relations, he gets the key out from under mother's pillow, that's ontological security, then he has access to the real self, the real self allows the person knowledge around what he likes, what's unique to him. The real self tells him uh, that it's okay to mourn losses, the real, because the real self will give him whatever feelings he needs to mourn the losses. The real self will allow him the appropriate emotions for this. So for example, if it's, if it's joyful, he's in the present, he's happy, the real self will say, it's okay, you can be happy. The real self will allow him mutuality, I'm okay, you're okay in relationships. Okay. Although the alternative is, if he's bogged down in those earlier patterns, I'm not okay, you're not okay, or this, uh, I'm this deluded, I'm okay, and you're not okay. You know, these other ones, uh, you see, 
that's a hostile negative symbiosis or somebody trying to get their symbiosis and they're arguing all the time those marriages are often like sour milk but and the main fears in the dysfunctional relationships are exaggerated fears of being engulfed impinged upon by the mother or abandoned and that's why they're so angry and demanding and all these rules and all this but in the I'm okay you're okay they're more relaxed they're more, it's more flexible both partners are relaxed and trust each other um, they're not neither one neither one's bogged down with exaggerated fears of abandonment or engulfment right so they're free to enjoy the present they're more playful they're more creative and their marriages become like fine wine you see so you need the real self um, the real self lets you know what you like and if you know what you like and you express what's unique to you that's meaningful that's just describes that as meaning in life being meaningful if you're bogged down being Sisyphus trying to show up the mother and battle with the mother trying to tell the mother this and trying to show the world how bad the mother if you're caught in that that's how, how that's not meaningful right you're missing the meaning in life that's called depersonalization or deep, you know, things like that um, so so we're gonna add to our thread on this important topic of symbiosis to raise awareness around this issue of symbiosis. Yeah, no, uh, no, uh, I think this is the first time we've had no birds. Yeah, this is the first. This is the first time we've had no birds, not even a seagull. Wow. Maybe they're all starting to fly south. I mean, uh, the Kenley geese. Yeah, in the last video, I talked about the moon bird. If you want to hear about an interesting bird. Uh, oh, by the way, in the last video, uh, the long one, two hours and 15 minutes, that one there, if you go to the... How are we doing here with the lights? If you check out the last video, um, the long one, two hours and 15 minutes, if you go to the two hour and two minute mark uh, around there and start from there, you'll see some Canada geese flying above. So you'll see a nice, uh, it only lasts for one or two seconds, but we, but we got a glimpse of the Canada geese in the last video and they were honking which is nice yeah but today's strange this is a this is an eerie day eh? an odd day here <laughs> oh I stand corrected here's one seagull I don't know if you can see him but there's one seagull flying over there Okay, that's good. So things are normal. Okay, okay. <laughs> oh, there's another one now. Oh, yeah. So things are normal here. Oh, there's a whole... Oh, there they are. Yeah, there's lots of seagulls down there. Okay, that's good. <laughs> you can tell I have, I have nature deficit disorder. Um, so... The takeaway the take message here is... The baby needs what's called optimal symbiosis. He needs the psychological egg. So let's uh, discuss a little more about this uh, question of symbiosis, what it is, and um, let, let's somehow highlight it. And just let's, these quotes will, will offer some little vicissitudes around it to make us more aware of this issue of symbiosis. So let's begin here. Okay, so uh, TQ 1532. Okay, by eight months, babies are solidly in the first post-symbiotic stage of separation individuation that Mahler termed differentiation. Okay, so this, this author says at eight months, he's solidly in the first main stage of differentiation. He's... I don't know what the percentage is, but he's differentiated to a 
a significant degree. He's differentiated. Now love and gratitude have entered the psychological picture. So we can say that beginning at eight months, some love and gratitude have entered the psychological picture. Love and gratitude is needed for differentiation. If differentiation does, takes place to some degree, then to that degree we say that love and gratitude to that degree have entered the psychological picture. Okay. The next further differentiation is at 15 months and then finally at 36 months is the final differentiation where he achieves the psychological, where he gets the key out from under mother's pillow. You see? When he gets the key out from under mother's pillow, he gets differentiation. He's psychologically himself, he's spiritually himself. He's not going to be tied to his mother's apron springs emotionally all the time. The mother won't be able to use all these guilt trips on him. Now if the mother does use a lot of guilt trips on the child, he's in a negative symbiosis and he's stuck there waiting for the mother to change her ways. Okay, the next one here. Symbiosis, which for the child is an undifferentiated condition. Okay, a fusion or a closed circuit with the mother where the two have a common outward border, thereby protecting the immature ego of the child against too early stress. So he calls it, a, his jargon here, it's a, like a closed circuit between the mother and the baby. It's like a little loop there. Because the baby in the womb, it's like a circle loop there, right? Through the cord, placenta to the mother, the mother to the placenta, down the cord to the baby, baby to the mother, mother to the baby. It's like this little circle, this loop there. Now in the extended womb, in the social symbiosis, that mother, that feeding, the mother and the baby, they're still doing this closed loop thing, right? That's what he means. And this protects the baby from stresses. Oh, hold on. Got a seagull here. Okay, the next one here. See if I can see it. Okay, <laughs> hold on a sec. Okay, one young mother adopted a prolonged symbiotic mothering. You see, that's a negative symbiosis. It shouldn't be prolonged, right? You see, uh, it should, from four to five months, uh, the symbiosis uh, pretty much mostly ends, but the mother prolonged it. That's a negative symbiosis, right? Okay, now her sister, the other mother, now, she didn't do that. She, she allowed the separation, individuation process, right? I think the example was the, these two sisters. It was interesting because one sister uh, used the baby to meet her needs. Uh, the other sister used herself to meet her baby's needs, okay? In, in, that, in that second case, the child grew up healthy and functional. In the first case, uh, the child grew up uh, Okay, uh, one person described, okay, hold on a sec. Okay, one person described his mother as intrusive, wanting to know everything that he did and where and when he went, and their relationship, and their relationship was symbiotic. Okay, he felt he couldn't think independently nor make decisions uh, for himself, okay, because He's afraid, unconsciously in his mind, that his mother might not be happy if he makes decisions for himself. Uh, maybe that triggers the memory of when he was a child, when he wanted, when the child wanted to make decisions for himself. Maybe the mother thought that uh, the baby was going to abandon the mother. Meaning, the baby becoming autonomous triggered the mother's fears of how she felt abandoned by her mother. So that, that might be a clue. If some mothers are like uh, micromanagers and they want to know every little micro thing, every second, every minute, what are you doing, what do you think, where are you going, that's the mother who wants to hold on to her symbiosis. 
you see, the mother has parentified the child, has turned the child into a mother for her, and the mother's demanding to know every little thing. Now the excuse will be it's for your safety, uh, that's some truth to that of course, but I think she overplays that because her covert motivation you see, is to preserve the symbiosis. Okay, um, okay, the next one here. Okay, within the traumatic attachment or the negative symbiosis, okay, or the insecure attachment style, okay, the nonverbal child holds tight to a rigid, inhibitory, symbiotic parent's body that is instantiated, okay, symbolized or abstracted within, right? Within implicit stratial circuits within the path. Okay, so within the pathological attachment, a symbiotic parent-infant bond body merger is okay. Instantiated, abstracted within. Okay, or symbolized within the basal ganglia, leading to a short-circuited. Thalamo, amygdala, basal ganglia, stratial, thalmic, uh, self perpetuating loop. There's the loop there, right? Okay, uh, okay, so the brain develops from the bottom up. Okay, the brain develops from the bottom up to the early symbiotic. Okay, in the early symbiotic period, okay, brain stem and deeper limbic circuits will be shaped within the attachment. Again, in the early symbiotic period, brain stem and deeper limbic circuits will be shaped within the attachment. Okay, so that's the implicit memory system, the pre-verbal memory system. A lot of these circuits are being laid down, neuro networks, right? Electricities flowing around. Oh, hold on a sec. Oh, look at that. Yeah, we got two two seals over there. Let's see. Hold on. They might make a reappearance in a moment. Let's see. Oh, oh, there are three of them. Yeah, look at that. Yeah. Those are large seals. Yeah. Yeah, those are the largest seals I've seen. Three jumbo seals. <laughs> yeah, they could be a tree. Uh, yeah, we played some uh, music from rock trios. Uh, the Santos Band, that's a rock trio. Triumph is a rock trio. So that's um, so forgive by so forgive biology for its jargon. Just forgive it. But you know that quote there sort of conveys uh, sort of this. Uh, I think it highlights the importance for mothers to give the child love because the brain is going to record it. Okay, the baby's right. The baby's uh, amygdala, the basal ganglia, all this thalamic. Uh, stratial business, the baby's brainstem is going to record what's going on. If the baby's loved, all right, then it's peaceful there and the brain can develop. If it's trauma there, oh, the memories are deep in there, you see, and then it's too stressful. If it's too stressful, right, then the child doesn't develop. Okay, Shen Gold, another difficult author here. He construes a maternal imago and his discussion of nar in the narcissist myth, okay, positing that the depth of the pool of water symbolizes the medium for symbiotic entrapment. Yeah, it's interesting how a lot of people have their interpretations about the narcissistic myth. I sort of agree to some degree with this, that uh, narcissist, uh, the character narcissist, is staring at an image of himself see that's the fusion that's the symbiosis he's transfixed he's stuck there he sees his mother he's looking for his mother but he sees himself 
but he's looking for his mother but he's the mother so he's her he's himself it's a fusion there and he's stuck there I think that image sort of conveys that uh, look search for the mother and uh, so there's a symbiosis I think in other words that image is symbiosis somehow One theory. So we'll update, see if we can update that one. Okay, hold on a sec. Okay, yeah, a hall of mirrors. So symbiosis, one person calls it a hall of mirrors. Okay, because of a lack of symbiotic experience with the mother, right, the client transferred uh, his needs onto the employer. So one employee didn't get their symbiotic, symbiotic needs met and they regarded their employer as their mother. So they were very uh, attached that way, right? And I think he even said that at one point, because of the fusion, he sometimes thought that he is the company. So first he thought the company was his good mother and because of the fusion, he sometimes thinks the company is him. So either he says, uh, Okay, so fill in the blank, you know, company X. You might say, oh, this company X, that's my good mother. Now, because the image of the self and the image of the other in his psychic mind is fused, if he's under stress, he can flip around and sometimes he may say, I'm company, you see, uh, fusion like that. Okay, just one author's idea there. Um, so we're just trying to understand this issue of symbiosis. That's all we're trying to do here. Okay, the experience, okay, of bliss, Okay, associated with falling in love involves recapitulating or sorry recapturing the pleasure of the symbiotic phases of development okay so the honeymoon phase the, the blissful stage the guy and the girl are in this blissful oceanic oneness together they're recapturing sort of what the baby experiences with their mother during the symbiosis you see so if the child did have a positive symbiosis, maybe they, they can sustain that for a while. But if the child had a negative symbiosis and he got a positive symbiosis in falling in love, they're going to be triggered of the negative symbiosis and then they're going to flee out. So the honeymoon period will be over then because they're triggered of being either engulfed or abandoned or trapped in the tar pit of the negative symbiosis. If a couple is truly uh, symbiotic, uh, they're in bliss, right? So again, the honeymoon phase is symbiotic, so they're in bliss, right? same idea, okay. Okay, the client's, uh, hold on. The client's extreme physical exercise had symbolic meaning for him. Okay, the client's extreme physical exercise had symbolic meaning for him. Okay, one, uh, it meant survival from the fear of mother's mishandling of him and his once perceived uh, threats of her abandonment, right? Also, preserving the grandiose self-image as a way station or a waiting room for mother's love. So he's saying here, if the mother mishandled the baby, uh, person may grow up and compensate by developing a lot of extreme muscles uh, to protect himself. Okay, hold on a sec. Let's see if I can find the cursor here. Okay, maybe I'll just take a little stretch here for a sec. Hold on. Let's see.
I guess the theory around that one would be that uh, if he's doing that, it's in response to the way his mother mishandled him. That means he's still waiting for mother's love. So he may maintain an extreme exercise program uh, as a defense against the memories of being mishandled by the mother. And at the same time, while doing that, right, the inference is that uh, He's trying to communicate. Maybe he's trying to. Commun that's maybe that's his Sisyphus. Maybe he's saying, "Look, uh, mother, look, look at all these muscles I have. See, now you can't hurt me. I'm showing you that I was hurt by you, and I'm, and I'm. That's why I'm doing this to tell you. You know, I'm trying to master the trauma of you dropping me or whatever you, whatever mishandling you did. For more information about that difficult topic, look up Edmund Burglar's. Uh, the fears of the baby. He has a thing called, uh, he lists uh, some of the fears that the baby develops. The mishandling one and uh, the mother being intrusive or uh, and so on. Actually, we haven't covered that one. I sort of skipped that one. But uh... Okay, we'll do a couple of more here on symbiosis. Oh no, I think that's it for symbiosis. Okay. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, no, no, we'll continue on symbiosis. Yeah, these are all on symbiosis here. Okay. Fairy tales are understood as representing fundamental developmental conflicts. Okay. Fairy tales are understood as representing fundamental developmental conflicts. So all that we're discussing here, unmet symbiosis, the narcissism, right? The mother being more frustrating than loving. Okay, that's represented in fairy tales and myths. Right? Those are symbolic images of the, me the painful memories. Okay? That's why they have an enduring power. Right? That's, that's, um, that, that's why uh, these fairy tales last. Right? For example, in one fairy tale, the, the child ate the gingerbread house. Well, maybe that represents the child's wish to merge with the mother, the symbiotic mother. So maybe the child was very hungry and wanted mother's love. So maybe that, in a fairy tale, that's represented, that wish is represented by the child eating the gingerbread house. Wanting to take in the mother, wanting to receive mother's love, and he's not getting it, so he's so angry, he wants to eat, <laughs> he's biting, he wants to eat mother. He's trying to communicate to his mother, hey mother, uh, feed me, uh, nurse me, uh, be there for me. And if he's enraged, he's gonna wanna bite her. And if he's, if he's not loved in the fairy tale, he might eat uh, the gingerbread house. So the gingerbread house is the sweet mother, represents the mother, uh, or the breast, let's say, and then he wants to eat that. Uh, he's trying to, that's the trauma of, of the baby not getting his symbiotic needs met. So myths and fairy tales describe childhood trauma, developmental trauma, relational trauma. Myths and fairy tales are the psychology of trauma, developmental trauma. Yeah. Good witch, uh, bad witch, they represent the mother. Both characters, the, fairy, the good fairy godmother and the frightening demon creature, the goddess or the demon, they both represent two sides of the mother. When the mother is loving, the child uh, in the memories and the pre-verbal uh, primary process thinking it's archaic it's, uh, the images are exaggerated right so that's it. Like in the fairy tale that's shown as the goddess if the mother's uh, rejecting uh, the mother is seen as a frightening de demonic demon creature or a frightening animal or a bad witch but there but these are images in response to the relationship the baby had with his mother. So they're the outcome of his relationship to his one single mother, creating these two images that are split. The child uses splitting and then denies one side when the pain outweighs the love. That's a developmental trauma. That's an insecure attachment style. Anytime the pain and rejection outweighs the love, splitting is used, that's a developmental trauma. Then we have myths and fairy tales to describe all that. 
again in yesterday's video I sort of did a brief overview of the internal theater around this the internal theater internal object relations world called the endopsychic structure okay which uh, myths and fairy tales describe again myths and fairy tales are true on the inside not on the outside myths and fairy tales describe one psyche uh, a myth one mythological story describes one person's traumatized psyche one fairy tale again one fairy tale story describes one traumatized one traumatized child's psyche you see and uh, since nobody's perfectly 100% healed everyone has some linkages to it somehow but the more traumatized we are the more maybe we're we feel some uncanny recognition with them. You know? So that's why they're they're enduring appeal over thousands of years, right? And he says it right here, right? He says it right here. Fairy tales are understood as representing fundamental developmental conflicts. Okay? The fundamental developmental conflict is that the child didn't get his symbiotic needs met. He wasn't seen, he wasn't held, he didn't get his secure base needs met, he didn't get his communicative matching needs met. His golden ball got put into this bag and all of his feelings got repressed. That's that's the, the wild man or the moon bird. I'm gonna call it the moon bird. That's that <laughs> scrappy bird that gets into the goes into the bag. Previous videos talked about Robert Bly's metaphor of the bags. So I won't redo it here. Okay. Okay, next one here. People living the emotional pain of unrecognized trauma fill the psychological consulting room with their silent cries, open wounds, and the rest of development. Okay. So apparently, apparently, one reference is that up to 70% did, in North America didn't receive a secure attachment style. That means 30% are sort of holding the stability of things, you know, 30%. So he was saying we need more people in, in the 70% to do the healing to join the 30%. You know, we want the love to outweigh the, the hurt and the pain. Right? So man's main task is to do the self-healing, right? If he needs to do it. Okay, man's main task is to give psychological birth to himself if he didn't naturally get it by the age of three with a secure attachment style. Okay, the next one here. Transference manifestations of her dependent expectations resulted in better understanding of her own needs and emotions, which helped to promote a separation individuation process that had been arrested at the symbiotic level. Now I don't use this phrase, I'll just briefly mention it. I don't, I don't like it, I don't use it. But this author here, I think it was this author. How do you describe that level of high dependency that the baby has? You see, someone complained about that term symbiosis, they don't like it. It's, it's the best approximate metaphor we have to describe the baby's high, very high dependency on the mother. Is there anything better? Is there any other term that's better than that? Is there any other term that that can describe the baby's immense sense of complete, total need, absolute need for the mother? Is there any other term better than symbiosis? So one author offered one, and I'm not going to pass it along because I really don't like it. Yeah, no, I don't, I'm going to drop it. I think symbiosis is really the best term for it. I, I, I also can't think of any better term for it. Stern doesn't like it, um, but, but everyone else is using it. Oh, there's the seal. Hold on. Another one. Sun's coming out, that's nice. Oh, there's the seal. Hold on. Oh, no. Just it. 
Oh, hold on. Okay, things are back to normal here. So there's some birds there. Can you see them? Oh, there they go. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so things are normal around here. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, um, I would say 99.9% .9 of the authors are using symbiosis, a term. Okay, um, okay, now, a slight de a slight a side a foot okay a slight uh, segue here okay it is difficult at times to tell which type of self object transference um, have formed okay self object so symbiotic transference to distinguish between the grandiose demand for mirroring the symbiotic need for merger okay the, the communicative matching one the twinship one or the demand for approval and confirmation and holding by the idealized parent. So this Kohat guy, he breaks down symbiosis into sort of subcategories. He says, he calls it self-object needs. So his, his jargon for symbiosis is self-object needs. We're calling it symbiotic needs. If the client was traumatized very early on, his self-object need or, self or symbiotic needs are for to be held and soothed by a powerful other. Uh, if his symbiotic needs or self-object needs are in that second phase, his needs are for mirroring, to be seen, right? If it's during that rapprochement phase, his uh, needs are for that communicative matching, that twinship he calls it. The twinship, the improv, yes and, it's like they're buddies, they're playful together, that kind of thing. Now, here's, here's a diversion here. There's a guy named uh, Spotsnitz. Now he has the theory that with some people, maybe it is possible, maybe you have to engage in a symbiosis. So I include this quote here for the purpose of describing what object relations theory is not. Object relations theory, the psychodynamic theory, the psychoanalytic perspective, psychoanalysis and all that, it's not this, the Spotsnitz one, okay? So there's a guy, he says, well, his theory is, well, if they're, in a, if they're in a state of timeless unconscious, maybe you can just meet, meet their symbiotic needs. No, you can't. It can't be done after the age of five. It's, it's impossible. It's biologically, structurally, the brain has developed beyond that. He thinks, uh, I don't agree. I think we can do it. So he, if you read his book, I just glanced at it. He tries to do it. He tries to do it. A person says something, he says, oh yes, and, the, and I agree with you. And the therapist just agrees with everything, like the mother would agree. He's, she's trying to be, he's trying to recreate the symbiosis. And, and if he misses, the person's enraged. And see, I, It's not this. I, I, so 1001 Windmills of the Mind is not about anyone literally trying to meet the person's needs that they needed as a baby. This series is all about building our understanding, our knowledge, giving ourselves basic trust so that we can be our own caring witness to engage in the mourning process, right? Um, man's main task is to give psychological birth to himself. To do that, he needs the knowledge, the understanding, the insights. These, so these theories help. These. These, this jargon helps, uh, these interpretations help, and things make sense, then we forgive the mother, it brings up feelings, then we can mourn, you see, and then uh, 
we can heal the splits and then we feel comfortable now that we know ourselves with that safety we can then get the key out from under mother's pillow All right so we're trying to heal sisyphus we need knowledge we're trying to be our, our, our own caring witness we need knowledge right we're trying to get the key out from under mother's pillow and heal the splits we need knowledge okay so these quotes are trying to give us some of this knowledge here okay um the therapist's empathy and understanding was experienced as a telepathic message that activated the symbiotic fantasy of being at one with the good mother of the early childhood So, if the ther this example was the therapist said, hey, that she gave empathy to the client, and the client immediately re recreated the symbiosis with the therapist. Aha! Now that's an opportunity for a transference. You bring that to their attention. Did you notice that when I understood what you were going through, um, you formed an, ex an excessive attachment to, to me, right? That means you didn't get their, your symbiotic needs met. You see, I don't know how they would word it, but the, the idea would be uh, psychoeducation, psychological education, right? But she would do it in a poetic, interpretive way. That's their skill that they can uh, that they can offer these interpretations. It's a craft. It's an art to be able to phrase this properly with the right timing, with the right words. So the therapist offers um, an interpretation that brings. Uh, that brings to one's consciousness how when they received empathy that they transferred their unmet symbiotic needs and they want to be aware of that if you're aware of it now you're getting now you're, you see the consciousness gives you the the love the consciousness is the love the, the understanding and you're getting right is the love you see Um, okay, there was a long period of symbiotic merger with urgent demands for my undivided attention, empathetic, empathic responsiveness, and uh, participation in the regulation of our affective states. Okay, so this describes again what it would be like if someone were to try to get their symbiotic needs met with the therapist. They would always want perfect mirroring, they, they, they would always want to be soothed if they were upset. They want, want things to be perfectly consistent and perfect responsiveness. The therapist, uh, you know, can't glance away. Oh, you broke the symbiosis. The therapist can't do something that the client doesn't like. Oh, you broke the symbiosis. You see, so you're not. So this highlights this issue of symbiosis, right? Okay. Uh, the fantasy. Uh, his fantasies of belonging to another family or his, quote, family romance, okay, uh, was related to his fear of uh, drowning in a symbiotic uh, merger with the mother or returning to the symbiosis. So if the child is in a negative symbiosis, that's painful, he has what's called the romance fantasy. He has this fantasy that he really belongs to a loving family. And one day this other, his true parents, who are loving people, are gonna save him and he's gonna be reunited with his loving parents. Now this fantasy is an escape from the pain of the tar pit of the negative symbiosis. See, so fantasy is also a defense mechanism against pain, right? Now usually with the family romance they fantasize that they belong to rich people or some king and queen in some happy beautiful place and you know they have these uh, elaborate fantasies uh, like that right? um okay a uh, little shift the topic here okay rituals that seek contact with the spirits of, rituals that seek contact with the spirits of ancestors okay now doing this sort of echoes the symbiotic ties with mother and infant Okay, so in some indigenous cultures, they would engage in rituals where they want to be reunited or have contact with the ancestors. Um, that kind of fantasy, he says here, sort of has a kind of a echo uh, to, the to the resemblance of the mother-child symbol. In other words, um, 
fantasies of connection with a great other is sort of a, a replay of uh, the symbiosis with the child and the mother. Again, fantasies are a defense against anxiety. Now this uh, can be fairly benign, um, different degrees of it. People go to, uh, right, that's what religion's for. Uh, oh, you're gonna merge, have a oneness with the great sky figure and you're gonna be one. And, okay, so that's trying to uh, appeal to that stress relief by giving you the fantasy. Remember, fantasies deal with anxiety. Okay. So just like the romance fantasy the child had, that he was born of beautiful parents somewhere, uh, in the religious thing, or in this ritual here, they're fantasizing being one or together with this other, or these other good uh, people. Right? So a similar general idea. Um, you see, and, uh, and the religion doesn't make you aware of this. They don't offer interpretations. They're not making you aware of this. That's the difference between the therapy and the religion. Uh, uh, religion wants, wants just to give you that comfort, right, to soothe your anxiety. So, but the therapy offers an interpretation of that transference. So the therapy wants you to heal from the trauma, to get better. The religion just makes you maybe feel better for the moment, that's all. Right? So religion was, um, yeah, I won't, I won't get into that topic. We have a sort of a sub-thread on religion, on the psychology of religion. I'll have to leave that for earlier videos. Okay, um, okay, finding a balance between, okay, finding a balance between the two extremes of never saying no and always saying no. So that's an extreme, right? Never saying no or always saying no, okay? Now this will require that both the parent and the child extricate themselves from a blurred, undifferentiated state of the symbiotic unity by recognizing the needs of the other. So that, that's an example of um, the symbiosis. It's either all this or all that. The splitting is there, right? So constant no or constant no, no. Constant yes or constant no, that's like a fusion there. That sort of represents that fusion. Uh, okay, the alchemists, long ago, the goal and, quote, gold of the alchemists, okay, it was the union of opposites, okay, again, the goal and, quote, gold of the alchemists, what was it? It was the union of opposites, okay, the integration of the terrible mother with the good mother, through a process of realizing an unloved self that has separated from a complete symbiotic tie to the terrible mother. Okay, so here... Okay, if we only get one quote out of this collection, it's this one. Uh, this quote is the key quote to highlight in today's video. This one here, again. Okay, the goal and quote gold of the alchemists, okay, what was it? The union of opposites, okay? The integration of the terrible mother and the good mother, that's the splitting, right? Through a process of realizing an unloved self, okay? That's the hungry and raged part self, the, the despised self, the unloved self that's repressed, okay? through a process of realizing that we weren't loved, okay? Now, with that realization, we have to somehow, that means we're connected to the terrible mother, okay? The more terrible the mother is, the more bonded we are to her. Now, if we realize that we're unloved, then we realize that we're bonded to the frightening mother, the terrible mother. Now, when we separate from her, okay? When we separate from the terrible mother, now we can begin the process of uniting the two mothers, the two sides of the mother. Okay, 
hold on a sec. I need to take another little stretch here. So let's spend a minute on this quote because this is the most important quote in today's video. If you can get this, if you can understand this quote, oh, that's that's great. No mother can perfectly meet the baby's needs. So the baby feels. Uh, that the mother is being rejecting. Let's let's use the jargon here. The, the mother's terrible from the baby's point of view. But the baby can't bond to the terrible mother. But he is bonding to the terrible mother. But in his delusion, he can't think that he's bonding to the terrible mother. So he, he creates two images of the mother, the terrible mother and the good mother. Now he's bonded to the terrible mother, the rejecting mother. Now he hallucinates that he's bonded to this manufactured image of the good mother. Now there's some truth to it, but he, he elaborates on it. So he thinks he's bonded to the good mother, world's greatest mom, greatest mom, mother's so perfect, all this stuff. But he's truly bonded to the rejecting terrible mother. That's the splitting defense mechanism. Now this, this, this metaphor of the alchemy bringing the two sides together, the union of the opposites. How do you do that? The person has to recognize that there is an unloved that there is an unloved self. And then if they get to that point, they realized they realize that they're in a negative fusion with the frightening image of the mother. And that's the reality. The reality is they're in fusion with the negative rejecting mother. Now then their then their hallucination of mother is the, so great. That's the splitting defense, but there's two mothers. You see, Selani explains it. When the child creates two mothers, good mother, bad mother, or good mother, terrible mother, the child thinks they're different people. The child doesn't even acknowledge that the terrible mother is his mother. That the, the child thinks only the good mother is his mother. This other terrible mother is just high. Right? Remember in Jekyll and Hyde, it's one person. The child doesn't get that. It can't handle that idea. So, um, this, this is a key concept because a lot of authors uh, focus on this point. They, they all admit, here's where a lot of people give up on psychology. Here's where a lot of people, uh, one person said they threw the book away. <laughs> they can't accept the idea that the mother was more rejecting than loving. They, 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 um, they can't do it. Because they are the mother. They're fused with the mother. They've become her. That's their identity. So to, to admit that the mother was so terrible, it, it feels like they're losing themselves because they are the mother. When the mother's so terrible, they identify with the aggressor. That's why it's so hard to accept this idea that the mother was more unavailable than loving. But somehow, if a person can get to that point, right? They're going to be very angry at the mother. Uh, they'll hate the mother for a while. Um, then, then, like we said before, they're going to do some research about the mother. Maybe the mother had um, prenatal distress syndrome. Maybe she has birth trauma. Now, prenatal distress syndrome makes a person vulnerable to birth trauma if there are complications at the birth the mother may have had intergenerational trauma meaning she didn't get a secure attachment style right uh, the mother may have had some kind of trauma in the environment trauma uh, in early childhood at the dentist's office while getting their tonsils out school shock Maybe with the siblings, maybe with family members, maybe in the, in the neighborhood, 
people, uh, the mother may be stuck in, the, in her trauma. Then you understand why uh, the mother could, was more frightening, was more terrible uh, than loving. Then you're angry at, you know, <laughs> and you're angry uh, at those factors, and then you start to forgive the mother. Now, when you start to forgive the mother, then you start to accept her. Then you're starting to accept the reality. When you accept the reality, uh, now you're starting to do the alchemy. Now you're recognizing that there were some good... Bruce Springsteen. So back to that song, Independence Day. He talks about this. Actually, that intro is exactly about this quote. Now you recognize Bruce Springsteen said, yeah, there were blessings and there were problems. Uh, curses and blessings, I think he said. Now you recognize that there were... There were there were bl blessings, right? And there were curses, and you're starting to recognize the two. Now you're an alchemist. Now you're bringing those two together. As you can bring those two together, um, in effect, uh, what you're doing is, in order to bring the two together... Oh, hold on! In order to bring those two sides together, the love and understanding has to, has to pile on to the appreciation that we have for our parents. So the good that we can pluck out from our parents, we got to infuse our understanding for them. That leads to forgiveness for them. The more we do that, the more we, we are able to bring the split sides together to create a whole image of the mother as an ordinary person that's that's the gold you see that's whole object relations then that and the gold is getting the key out from under mother's pillow now remember when we get the key out from under mother's pillow then we unlock the cage that iron john is in and iron john gives the boy his golden ball back that's the alchemy he gets the gold he gets the gold you see, so the alchemy is you get the gold. How do you get the gold? You got to heal the splits. You see? So, uh, yeah, I just noticed myself calming down now after an hour and 40 minutes. Yeah. Maybe at the beginning I was feeling a little anxious in this video. See, nature therapy. I think sitting out in nature uh, calms me down a little bit. But, uh, you know, I think it's worth it for this quote. If you, if you manage to watch all of this and you got to this point, you, you, I think you got something of value here. This is TQ, um, what is it? Hold on. TQ um, uh, 1554. Okay, that's a very good quote. TQ 1554. 1554, very good quote. Okay, so... We are tasked to be our own alchemists. Meaning, what I sort of just now tried to describe, bringing the splits together, forgiving the mother. Because when the love and the forgiveness outweighs, when our understanding grows and our knowledge grows and our understanding grows, okay, we forgive the mother, oh, we get it, she's an ordinary person, aha. We get the key out from under mother's pillow, Okay, and then we get the golden ball. You see, so that's being our own alchemist. Now, to do that, we have to be our own existential detective to get to that point, right? So these quotes are helping us to be our own existential detective because all of these quotes are from existential detectives. Almost every quote in this collection is from an existential detective. 
and um, some of the best existential detectives. Um, the work, their work. Yeah, okay, it's a nice little... Yeah, isn't it nice? I kind of like this. Yeah, lots of nice blue here, yeah. Yeah, I, th I think now would be a good time to start the video. <laughs> Okay, so um, we have some excellent existential, we have quotes from some excellent existential detectives. James Masterson, James F. Masterson, Edmund Burglar, Karen Horney, Margaret Mahler, Melanie Klein, William Fairbairn, Robert Bly, as a sort of a guest, uh, on, a guest mentor here. We've got quotes from Lachlan, Solani, Rinsley, and others, you know. So we've got a, a good team of existential detectives here. Their quotes are available. These quotes help us to be our own caring witness. Grief is healed when it's witnessed by a caring other. So these quotes are helping us to be our own caring other. These quotes are helping us to be our own alchemist to get the gold. When we get the gold, we find the real self, you see? And that's what we're all looking for. We're all looking for our golden ball, right? Now those 30% who had a secure attachment style, they have the golden ball. They're radiant, relaxed, natural, happy people. Their marriages are like fine wine, but apparently only, um, it's only about 30%. Right? Now that 30% figure, I'm not sure how it's broken down, but, um, A certain percentage of that 30%, uh, their marriages are like fine wine. Another percentage of that 30%, their marriages are um, okay. Now, this now for the 70%, about 20, yeah, about uh, 25, no, 15, right? 70%. Yeah, about 20% of that. So. Uh, those marriages are uh, together, but they're very painful. And the other 50%, that's the divorce rate, right? So 50% are divorced, 20% are together, but it's sour milk. Uh, another percentage, whatever it is, uh, is pretty good. And the balance are like fine wine. Right. Yeah. Another look here. Yeah, it's clearing up, yeah. Gee, what time is this? Wow, what is, th oh, hang on. Let's see. Almost five o'clock, yeah. I see. Now this nice clear weather is only gonna last for about an hour. Yeah, it's, it's a brief, uh, it's very brief. In about one hour, the sun, the sun will set. I did a video two or three days ago and the moon was out at 6 30. <laughs> okay 1554 let's celebrate that quote that's a great little quote um, I'd really like to highlight that quote get the last one here okay the negative therapeutic reaction quite typically enacts the symbiotic circle. Okay. So just a little footnote here. 
often when we are developing our awareness and we think we're getting better, there may be a temporary setback. That's called a NTR, negative therapeutic reaction. That's because we're not realizing the depth of the pain of not getting our symbiotic needs met. So a negative therapeutic reaction he's saying here is sort of a return to that negative symbiosis, that tar pit. You can't leave it. So you thought you're trying to leave it. How are we doing here? Right? So we're... Oh, there we go. Right? So... Oh. Just some... Uh, sneak no, not Canada geese. Yeah, I, I'm sort of hoping we might see the Canada geese. There's a little boat. I don't know if you can see it, but that white dot at the very end, that's a boat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so we have a thread in this series called NTR, called Negative Therapeutic Reaction. And uh, so this adds one more quote to it. He's saying here, you think you're going to get better and things got a little worse. You're, you're re-evoking the symbiosis. You can't leave the symbiosis. That means the symbiotic needs weren't met. Right? Now sometimes, uh, Masterson says that... Um, it's, it's a memory of the mother rejecting the person's self-activation. So you, that's why you, there may be a setback. Um, so you want to be aware of that. And then, uh, you know, forgive the mother, right? Realize that you're attached to the negative mother. So NTR is a clue that we're overly attached to the, to the unavailability of mother's love. Okay. Um, so I guess I'll just uh, leave it here. Let's end up uh, on our theme song. Our theme song to this uh, series is Katja Epstein's German rendition of the song Windmills of the Mind.
Okay, so thank you very much. This has been TQ 1432 to 1455. More to follow. Bye for now.